Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Appreciate you this morning on this Pentecost morning. We uh, are having our Pentecost service this morning, and uh, we encourage you to uh, be a part of that this morning. And if uh, you didn't catch the message of last week, uh, we will be having commune directly after the service. So if you want to get your items together and uh, be prepared for that, uh, we'd love to have you with us this morning. Uh, we'll be in Acts chapter 1 this morning. Uh, we will not be in our Revelation study. Uh, we'll be picking up on Revelation chapter 16 next week. Uh, but we have need this morning to uh, bring out the understanding of Pentecost and the reason why uh, that we celebrate and we continue to keep this feast. And so if you would, turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 1, verse number 1. And before we get started, we'll ask Father for his blessing. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask, Father, that you would open eyes and open ears this morning to your word. Allow your word to land on fertile ground, Father. We'll give you the praise and give you the glory for all things said and done. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Acts chapter 1 gives us a background of what was said before the ascension of Christ. And uh, the book of Acts, it's not said exactly who the writer of Acts is here in the scriptures. But as we take off here in verse number 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to to do and teach. With this terminology of Theopolis, we can track it back to the book of Luke, chapter 1. In the book of Luke, chapter 1, and verse number 3, it reads, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis. Now this word Theopolis in your Strong's in the Greek, it's 2321. And it means a good friend. And so that's what he's addressing. He's addressing you and I in this latter day. And so, again, in verse 1 in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, it says, The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis. In other words, friend of God. Of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles uh, whom he had chosen. And that's what he done. He told them exactly, uh, we'll get into that here in just a moment, but he did uh, tell these apostles. He said, wait upon this that is coming, uh, being the Holy Spirit. Wait in this uh, area in Jerusalem. Verse 3, to whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. In other words, after his uh, crucifixion on the cross and after uh, the three days and uh, as he resurrected, and that would be the passion, and being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what Christ done. He uh, shewed himself and stayed with them for the 40 days. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, uh, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. And that's exactly what he is saying here, is that uh, to wait until the Holy Spirit of God uh, has come and uh, done his part. And so, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And this was the 40th day that Christ had said that. And you say, well, what does the 40th day mean? Well, what he's talking about is 
Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. When Christ addressed these men, he addressed them on the 40th day after Passover. Verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And that's the question of every man, woman, boy, or girl that studies the word of God. When will be uh, the time when you come? When will be uh, the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. Verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses uh, unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the proclamation that Christ has given, not only to the disciples at this time that they were to teach and to preach, but I want you to do a little deeper thinking this morning. This pertains to God's election that will be used uh, uh, during the time that the Antichrist will be here, the time when you are delivered up before the council in Mark chapter 13, uh, it plainly tells us that uh, we will be witnesses and that we will be delivered uh, unto Satan, into his court, into his uh, trial, for say, wanting to know why it is that we do not worship him. And uh, you, you'll read over there in the book of the Revelation, chapter 2, uh, that we'll have tribulation for 10 days. And uh, that's what is claimed by God. And let me say first and foremost this morning that you must believe God, that God is going to do what he said he would do. Many things are written for our examples, for the examples, as Paul has said. But this is futuristic. This is something that is going to happen in the near future. And uh, I want you to be sure and facet it in your mind that the studies that you have done and the work that you have done throughout the years and uh, the uh, preparing for that time is needed. A lot of people would think, well, you know, why would uh, I put all this time and energy into studying the Word of God? So that you would be used. So that you would be used to be a witness as it said here uh, in verse 8, is the, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, all around the world. <clears throat> so, verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, in other words, while they were watching, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let me go on down and read just a little bit more. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, these are angels, stood by them in white apparel. 11, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. It's important that you recognize how that Christ ascended. He ascended through the same power that God came in Ezekiel chapter 1. The same power that will be used when he is returning. And uh, we know through Ezekiel chapter 1 that it was a uh, highly polished bronze vehicle that came and brought Father, and uh, that's how Christ would go. And so we see here that these men were 
gazing up into heaven, had no idea how that Christ was going to go, but after they had viewed, they did know. And let's go over to Acts chapter 2 and begin to read in Acts chapter 2. Now, this is the time when uh, the uh, brethren, the disciples, had uh, all come together. And as you would read on through chapter 1, it gives all the names of those in the upper room. And, uh, and it, they stood up amongst the disciples, and he said there was around uh, 120 men, 120 people at that time that were congregated together. Now, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, we're speaking here of the 50th day, the day of Pentecost. And um, something that is very important that Father wants you to realize is that in Hosea 6.6, 6, we quote this quite often, but I'm going to use it again this morning. In Hosea 6.6, 6, Father has claimed, he said, I, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice. God had no longer desired the sacrifice and the blood offering of dead animals. Christ, when he went to the cross, he done away with the blood ordinance. He done away with the need to sacrifice living animals again. Christ became our Passover. He was the Passover lamb. So when he was crucified, his precious blood was shed. Therefore, there was no need for it any longer. God had seen and given to Hosea this understanding. He's, he had seen it uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to hold my place there. I'm going to go one place here real quick. 1 Corinthians 10. And it reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not have that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud of the sea and did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock uh, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Five, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were, were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our ensamples uh, to the intent that we should not lust after uh, the evil things uh, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. <clears throat> Verse 16, the cup of blessing uh, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, meaning that Christ took the place of the sacrifice. So back in Hosea 6.6, 6, Again, he said, I desired mercy and not sacrifice. I no longer wanted you to sacrifice your animals anymore. It became, well, a, a bloody mess. And uh, they were not uh, pleased with it. They were not happy with it. And uh, he said here in verse 6, I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So we know that God desires you to have knowledge of him and to love him. When you gain that knowledge, love grows. And when you have that desire of love, then you search after the knowledge. So it works hand in hand. 
And that's exactly what God wants us to do. So in Acts chapter 2 in verse 1, it reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, in other words, 50 days after Passover, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now this word uh, wind uh, in the Greek, uh, it would be pneuma, uh, as in the air. But as we are speaking of the wind in the Hebrew, it is ruach. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God. So, as we read here, he said, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it was the ruach. It was the Holy Spirit. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire as it sat upon each of them. This word, Cloven means in every direction. In other words, not one particular direction did their speech go out, but it went in all directions, and their speech was done by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, Unlike what I believe a lot of people have heard, they did not begin to go crazy and, 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 and run around and, and, and be out of control and uh, began to speak words that uh, no man understood. It says here in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you must realize it was not these men that done this work on the day of Pentecost. Neither will it be you and I that will do that work when we are delivered before the council. It will be the Holy Spirit of God that will work through you and I, just as it did these men. Again, verse 4, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. This word tongues is nothing more than languages. Nothing more than uh, the word language. So if these men were capable of speaking different languages, at the best, maybe some can speak maybe three, maybe four languages or so. But we're going to read here in the next few verses just how many people were there. And it was not the power of the man, but it was the power of the Holy Spirit of God that worked through them on that day. And while I'm on that point, that's the very reason that we hold this feast today, to commemorate and to celebrate that marvelous work that was done on the day of Pentecost. And it will be done again on God's chosen people that will be delivered up before council. So, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under God. Now, if they were speaking languages, you would assume that he would be able to speak to some that he could... Uh, speak to and, and, and get his point across, but here it says that these men were devout men out of every nation under heaven. That's all over the world. How can a person be able to speak all of the languages throughout all of the world? How would one be able to do that except the Holy Spirit of God done it with them? Verse number 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, in other words, when everybody heard of it, the multitude came together and were confounded. These men were confounded 
It said, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And there was no interpretator needed. There wasn't need for somebody to tell you what he said. Everybody understood clearly, exactly, regardless where they were from, they knew exactly what he was saying. How was that? Because the Holy Spirit conveyed it to them. Just as the Holy Spirit has conveyed to you the mysteries of God's Word, although it may have been a man or a woman that brought it out, it was the Holy Spirit that sealed it in your mind and gave you confirmation and understanding from the Word. So we see here in verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? <laughs> In other words, these are just plain old men, just plain guys from Galilee. How is it that they're able to speak all the languages? And I can imagine these men looking around, and they would be, uh, people from Asia, and there would be people from Spain, and there would be people from uh, all over the world, and the different dialect that would be needed to use uh, to be able to speak to every individual. A man could not do that. It was only done by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse number 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue uh, wherein we were born? Now, I'm going to take just a moment. I've had a request that we explain how that the Strong's Concordance is used. So we're going to take just a moment and give you the understanding here. This word in verse number 8, tongue, the way that you utilize the Strong's Concordance, in the beginning it runs from A to Z. And you can see here that it has the markings from A to Z. So we're going for the word tongue. So we're going to go for the T's. The word tongue, T-O-N-G-U-E. Now, it gives us here in this column every scripture that is used in the Bible from Genesis to the book of the Revelation where the word tongue is used. Now, we are looking for the word tongue in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 8. So we go down here to Acts and number 2 and 8, and it gives us a number. It says G. One, two, five, eight, meaning Greek. When you pass into Matthew, into the book of the Revelation, that is spoken in Greek. From Malachi all the way back to Genesis is spoken in Hebrew. And that's how it is written. So, we are looking for the word tongue in Acts chapter 2, verse number 8. And it gives us G1258. I just happened to have it marked this morning for the sake of time. So you go over into the columns. It has a uh, Hebrew column, and you'll see that at all Hebrew. Then it goes into the Greek, and that's where we're at, into the Greek. And it gives you Greek 1258, and this is the meaning of the word tongue. And it says, dialectos, from uh, 1256, discourse, in example, dialect. So the word that were used in Acts chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, And how hear we every man in our own dialect wherein we were born? We kind of have a different tongue here in East Tennessee. We uh, have uh, some slang that is used periodically, and uh, up north, I'm sure there are uh, different uh, dialects, and overseas, there's different dialects, and it's exactly what he's saying is, how is it that we could understand 
exactly as we heard it from this man for it to be something that we could utilize. And it was spoken by the Holy Spirit of God in the dialect. So, at this point, I need to go over... I need you to look into Leviticus chapter 23. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23, in verse number 15. Leviticus 23 and 15. Now, Father has given Moses the instructions... Uh, for this 50th day. And we're going to give the reasoning for it here in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23 and verse 15, and it reads, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you were brought the sheaves and the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So, seven Sabbaths, a seven times seven is 49. And uh, that's the 49th day. Verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days. So, 50 days after Passover is when Pentecost is. <clears throat> 16, and even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. 17, ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deal, and they shall be of fine flour, for they shall be bacon with leaven. You must understand what it's saying here, that it was baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, this was made for the priests. This was made for the man of God. And uh, the, the man of God is worthy of his hire. And so that's, uh, and you would never place anything with leaven on the altar. Always remember that. Uh, what God is saying here is that the man of God is going to need to be taken care of here. Verse number 18. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish, and the first year one young bullock and two rams. Now, this recipe that he's saying here, he said the bread... <clears throat> with the bread, seven lambs. And this seven brings you into remembrance of the election. Father is told in his word, and he told Elijah that he had 7,000 uh, that would never bow a knee unto Baal, just as he has in this day. He has 7,000 that will not bow unto the Antichrist and are representative of that. Uh, without blemish, and the first year, in other words, these are the first fruits, and one young bullock, and this, the bullock is representative of wealth, and two rams. Now, the rams, you have to understand that these are fully mature lambs. If they are rams, in other words, they were lambs at one time, but now they are rams. We will take these as the two witnesses. He said here, They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings, and an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. 19. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid, the goats, for a sin offering, and two lambs for the first year of the sacrifice of the peace offerings. But we do know now that, as we have read in 1 Corinthians 10, that we no longer have to sacrifice these animals. 
that Christ became our sacrifice. He became this Passover. So as we pick back up in Acts chapter 2, in verse number 9, these are the people that were amongst all of those. These were the different uh, areas that are represented at this time. Trying to get your mind to think along the lines that there were many that were there that were not from that area. So verse 9, he said, Farthanians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia. So that really goes pretty broad. But verse 10, he's speaking about Asia Minor here. He says, uh, verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Serene, and this is the, the African nations, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. In other words, these proselytes are uh, from every other place. Verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And it's exactly what they did, and they were confounded. They did not understand, uh, just as you and I would not understand in that day, how it was that one could speak and everybody understand at the same time. How was that? It was through and by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean this? Doubt comes when there is confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Only Satan brings confusion. 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. In other words, they've been drinking. Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. He still had the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was bold at this time. And he said in verse 15, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And on this holy day of Pentecost, they were not to eat or drink until noon. <laughs> and they were assuming here in verse 13 that these men had already been drinking wine. And Peter told them, he said, But it isn't but the third hour of the day. When does the first hour start? At 6 a.m. From 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. is when they are there. So they weren't drinking. It was 9 a.m. And again, the only <laughs> more reason was because they were not to drink or to eat anything until that noon. Anyway, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And at that point's where we need to go to the book of Joel. Turn with me to the book of Joel, chapter 2, and verse 28. Actually, I want to go up to verse 23. Let's go to 23. Joel chapter 2 and verse 23. Joel 2 and verse 23, and it reads, Be glad then, 
ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. God has poured out His Spirit upon you and I in a way for us to understand His Word. We must have the Spirit of God to be able to understand God's Word. The average individual is not going to be able to understand nor understand the terminology without the Holy Spirit guiding you and I it cannot happen. And God has been good that way. He has blessed you and I with the former rain. He has sent down His Spirit in this day, in this time, in this trump that we are in for a time of sealing and understanding the Word of God. Now, in verse 23 again, He said, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. In other words, just a little at a time. Now, I'm glad for that, aren't you? That God didn't pour it out on us. I don't think my little mind would have been able to handle it all. But thanks be to God, he took time. And he took time with you. And he took time with me. And he says, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain. The rain is the understanding of the Word of God, the clarity that what you need to grow, you must have rain if anything is going to grow in this earth. You can take tap water and put it on it, but it don't do that much good. It might be uh, H2O, but it has a lot of chemicals in it. It's none like the true rain that comes from the Father, from the heavens. And he said, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. I'm under the impression that God will pour out his latter rain in a time when we need it. When will we need it, Brother Randall? You'll need it when the Holy Spirit speaks through you when it is the Holy Spirit that is directing you, and we know through the book of Mark that is told us in chapter 13 that we are not to premeditate what it is that we are to speak, but it, we are to wait upon the Holy Spirit and allow Him to speak through us. Just as we have read in Acts chapter 1, He said, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Mark chapter 13 and verse number three, uh, 11. Verse, actually, verse number 10, uh, chapter 13 and verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. And I know that many people say, well, that's why uh, many people have uh, missionaries and they go out and they publish it. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when you are delivered up before the council in Mark 13, verse 11, when you are delivered up before the council, that the whole world will view this. It will be on trial. Why will the whole world be interested in it? Well, the whole world will be in love with the Antichrist. And they'll want to know why it is that you do not love him. Why it is that you do not serve him. Verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit of God. 
So back in Joel chapter 2, verse 23 again, he said, and he would send the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And that's what God's promises are. I ask you this morning that you are to believe that God is going to do this. This is a promise from God. God does not break his promises. Kingdoms come. Nations come. Men come and they die. Women come that are famous and they die. Many of them we do not even know about. We do not have memory of. But the word of God will last forever and ever. I said that to say that his word is true. And he has no reason to mislead his children. These things are given to you and I, as I read in 1 Corinthians 10, that is for our ensamples. So in verse 24 in chapter 2 of the book of Joel, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. When the angelics are here amongst us, walking amongst us, and working amongst us, remember, who sent them? Remember that they are an army of God doing what God wants them to do. You say, well, it doesn't seem very nice that God's going to bring an army against us. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect those who have the seal of God in their foreheads. It's only going to affect those in Revelations 9 and 5. He said, harm only those who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty. And this is <clears throat> during the time of the millennial. And be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. <clears throat> and hath dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God. And none else in my people shall never be ashamed. Never to be ashamed. Verse 28 is the reason why I came. And it shall, now this is a proclamation by a father, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. If my mother was still here, she would say, I believe that scripture. My son is speaking and teaching of the word of God. And the same concept of many that go out and testify and try to bring people to the side of God instead of traditions of man. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. God is not a respecter of persons. Regardless of your position in this world, regardless how much uh, wealth you have or how uh, little wealth you have, regardless where you are, if God can use you, uh, that's whom his spirit is going to be on. And you were chosen before the foundations of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. God knows exactly whom it is that can receive this spirit at that time. Verse 30, and I will shew wonders uh, in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. These are signs of the time is what he's talking about. <clears throat> Verse 
in the book of Acts chapter 2, as we are reading, we're still in book of Acts. <clears throat> he said in verse 18 and 19, And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19, And I will shew wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and a vapor of smoke. The blood moons we've just had. We just came up on May the 18th. Today is the 22nd day of May 2022. On May the 18th, it was a 42nd anniversary of a time that God showed his children that he was on the throne. You say, well, what happened? May the 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted and brought forth smoke that was viewed throughout all of this nation. Here in East Tennessee, I can remember the fallout and the fogginess from all the ash that had came this far. He said here in verse... Verse 30 in Joel chapter 2, he said, I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Take a moment and look that up. 1980 is when it happened on May the 18th. And you'll see that that smoke, that when it came up out of Mount St. Helen, as the photographer took the video in the picture that he took, it was the outline of the face of a prophet standing to the side. A marvelous, marvelous work that God had done. These are signs that God said he would show unto you and I. God being the truth and every man being a liar. God never lets us down. He always shows us and gives us confirmation to exactly what we have need of. Verse 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. That's exactly what will happen as it is prophesied and as it is written. Verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. God will be there by your side as you are being delivered before counsel. You say, am I, am I able to even speak to God? Of course you can. You and I have that liberty. We read there in the the book of Matthew, that where the veil was ripped in twain, it was ripped in two, and no longer do we have need for a priest to uh, speak to God, but that you and I can speak freely unto him. And yes, you can call on the name of the Lord. Although the Spirit of God may be with individuals, those that would be viewing would have to think, man, that would have to be a scary time. That would have to be a time when all the world, all of the evil of this world is pressing upon you and watching you and listening to your every word. But it would be the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. Through and by the example that we have on Pentecost. And yes, you can call on the name of the Lord. And you shall be delivered. For the word of God teaches us that we will only have tribulation for ten days. Meaning that we'll only have trial for ten days. God is good that way. Back in Acts chapter 2. Finishing up. On verse 17. He said. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Thank God for men and women that want to teach the truth, that are sick and tired of hearing traditions of man, sick and tired of hearing people up these ministers that bring out traditions of man, sick and tired of God's children, Israel, being in the dark. Thank God for these men and women that want to bring out God's word and pass it along and share it with individuals. Thanks be unto God for them. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. 18, and my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 19, and I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's exactly what Peter was teaching. It's exactly what he was saying, that this is the hour that it was supposed to come. This is the time that Joel was speaking of. Not to be confused of the only time, because it will happen again. It'll happen in a time when it is most needed. Most needed by the help of God. I like what it says in Revelations chapter 3 and verse number 8. It says, I know thy works. He's talking to the church of Philadelphia. <laughs> he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and not denied my name. That little strength comes when God's Spirit is poured out on his children during the times that they will be delivered up. They will have this strength. God calls it a little strength. <laughs> I love that. Because Lucifer, with all his horde of angels, and all of his children that are here, the Kenites, he thinks he is mighty and very powerful. But I got news for him. God said he was going to open you and I, those that are going to need the help, with a little strength, a little strength from God, and keep my words and has not denied my name. Those that stood for God on that day, here in this near future, are going to be so blessed. What a blessing it would be to be a worthy vessel chosen by God to do a work for him. What a blessing it is. That's one of the very reasons why we want to emphasize this feast this morning. This time... of Pentecost. Now, I know that we are not on the 50th day. We uh, are celebrating it here on the 22nd. Your 24th will be your 50th day. We are celebrating it early because this is when we come and join uh, one with another. This is when we all come together. You say, now, are we not supposed to do this on the 50th day? Well, I couldn't get everybody here together on a Tuesday. And so we are taking part, and I know that Father sees it, and he appreciates it, and he loves the thought that we are keeping this feast Passover. 
So with nothing else to be said or done, we'll ask the men to pass out the uh, items. And while they are doing that, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And while he is passing out, if you want to get your items together, have all your items ready, and we will have this Holy Commune. While he is getting it, I'm going to read to you in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? <clears throat> a little sin goes a long way amongst God's people. Not only that, let me also bring out that this flesh that we are in. It represents the leaven. It's not clean. It's not holy before God. It's the spirit that's inside you and I that God loves. Although man would not think that he is greater or better, but the scripture says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Verse 7, purge out. In other words, get rid of. Therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. As you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's exactly what God wants. God wants truth to come out. What are truths, Brother Randall? It's His Word. It's His Word. How He spoke it. And as a teacher of the Word of God, we are to bring it out exactly how He spoke it. God wants us to clean some things up in our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 23, Before we read, we're going to ask Father for his blessings upon the commune service as we're about to partake. And I, I hope that we've given everyone plenty of time. Let us bow our heads. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for this blessed day. We observe, Father, that your day of Pentecost is a day set aside when the Holy Spirit will speak through individuals. And Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity and for an ability to be used. Father, we ask that you would bless this Holy Commune, bless each and every one, Father, that is partaking with us that they all may be whole and that leaven may be out of their system. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner, also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Before we take, we'll ask Father for his blessings one more time. Father, we come to you thanking you again for this day. We want to thank you, Father, for the bread of life. What it means to each and every one of us how that we have life and have it more abundantly today. And Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary through the work that Christ had done. We receive this, Father, and understand, Lord, that it was done to protect each and every one of your children through the sins that we have committed. Father, I love you, and I thank you again for this blessed day. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Again, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. And that's exactly what we're doing. The Rechabites would have no part in the commune. For they would have no part in the wine. But we know we do these things. To show the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. The word examine himself means to take everything from the world off of your mind. Put your mind solely on what Christ done for you and I. 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The commune that we have taken this morning, this feast that we have observed, is the, the feast of Pentecost, the 50th day. The understanding that we have gained through the scriptures is to help us and to protect us and provide for us wisdom for that day to come. When is that day coming, Brother Randall? Well, Brother Randall don't know. The Bible says no man knows. But we do know this, that when we are delivered up to the councils, that God will be right there by our side. Some of you good men and women, you say, you know, I've never been in, in, in jail. I've never been in prison. I don't know how that's going to be. When one is taken and they're innocent, there's no guilt, there's no charge, it appears that it would be a whole lot easier 
than to worry about what the sentence would be if they found one guilty. I said that to say this, that God's children are innocent, but they stand for the Lord, and that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to stand triumphantly and to proclaim the name of God. Whatever the question may be at that time, the Holy Spirit of God will convey it to you and use you on that day. I appreciate you. Thank you again for each and every one that's been a part of this service this morning. What a special time it is. Pentecost, the 50th day. We're looking forward for our Lord and that to return. We know that the Antichrist comes first and we know that he is uh, going to do everything he possibly can to sway the minds of the world. And thanks be unto God, he's shortened that time to 150 days, to five months. It's all the length of time he has. He said, had it not been shortened, that no flesh would be able to withstand. Even the elect would not be able to withstand it. God has us in his concern. We love you and we thank you again for being a part of this service. And We ask that you uh, continue to pray for us. Send us a, a comment. Send us a letter, would you? We, we look so forward to those. Uh, it, it means a lot to us. And we thank each and every one that... Uh, puts forth the effort and to help this ministry and support this ministry, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.